Yeah. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Get Out of Rap. Today, I'm joined by some of my favorite people again. This is the, the, the other part of the crew from Cactus Search. And for those of you that have listened to the previous um, two, I know you're looking forward to this. So welcome back, uh, Francesca. And hello to Kelly and Josh. Hi. Hi. <laughs> right, so I think everyone knows you, Fran, from uh, the previous two and, and just generally. And I know a lot of people in the industry know you, Josh and Kelly, but Kelly, if we can start with you, um, what's been your, uh, your background? Um, so I historically started off within contact centres um, about 12 years ago. Um, well, it was a bit, little bit longer because I've been at Cactus for about four years now. Um, but yeah, in total, 12 years contact centre experience. So back in the day, I started off within debt collection. Um, so I did quite a few years of that. And then I went to more customer service slash uh, sales. Um, and then I went to full sales and then I was poached by Guy and Francesca uh, to come to Cactus um, to come into recruitment, which I'd never done before. Um, so obviously it was a bit wary, um, but I've done really well at it. And yeah, so four years later, here I am. <laughs> well, let's go to the poacher before we come to you. <laughs> Why did you poach? Why, why did I poach Kelly? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's really easy because we actually went to her, cl the, cl the client she was working for, I went to visit them to talk about some recruitment. And, and as is often the way, they'll say, well, have a listen in to some of our, our, our top performers. So there I was sat next to her listening into these calls. And I thought, oh, gosh, she's, she's good, you know, and, and, <laughs> and um, fearless and all the great qualities you need to be a good recruiter and resilient, all those other things. And um it, in fairness, it wasn't an absolute poach. I don't want to think my I don't want my clients to think that I just go around nicking their staff. Um, in, in fairness, uh, it was a situation where the company was was having to make redundancies. So before that happened, I approached Kelly and said, um, you know, what about something new? Um, I knew she was great on the phones, and um, yes, I was right. Mm. I love it. Though. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> it's another example of just how there's so much talent on the phones it can lend itself to going into lots of other areas and I think Josh that's true of you as well isn't it yeah so I started probably about 12 years ago at Shop Direct uh, outbound sales advisor in Worcester probably there for about a year and a half uh, did some like sales training and that um, then I yeah I applied at recruitment company to work at D&G I lasted about four weeks and when the agency saw my bonus, they said, would you want to come and join recruitment? So yeah, I went in sort of fresh faced. I was about 18, um, very low salary, but I thought this could be a good career. And, and yeah, four years ago, applied for Cactus. Um, God, I started within three days and yeah, part of the, part of the team now, but yeah, I love it. Uh, before that, it was all temp recruitment. I did like eight years of temp recruitment. So it was very much three o'clock in the morning. I need six people at six o'clock. And it's just so nice to work in a different industry where I'd say it's not so slower paced, but it's perm recruitment. So booking interviews and it's a lot easier. So yeah, um, but yeah, I really enjoy it. I, I love how everyone that's come on um, from, from you guys genuinely seems to have this very authentic kind of enjoyment and affinity to, to the company. So it's, it's really nice to do these podcasts and kind of share some of that story. And, and we're, we're going to be talking about um, a key part of your world, and that's kind of um, volume recruitment, so volume campaigns. And, and why is this such a, a key topic, Fran? Um, I mean, you know, we, the whole volume recruitment piece has evolved hugely over the years and, and, and with us as a business as well. We didn't do it at all when we first started. Uh, it's something Guy and I really wanted to develop. We focused historically on management recruitment in contact centres. When we first met and back in our Capita days, I managed all the volume recruitment, outsourced volume recruitment for Capita. So I had lots of experience in it, but knew that 
to do it really well, you need really good people and you need a really good engine and you need good technology. So we had to invest in that. It took a while for us to get the, the model right. And we, we got the model right post COVID and we were really running some very big campaigns with a whole team dedicated to volume recruitment. Um, and it it worked really well. Um, you have to have you have to have quite a big pipeline to run a, a big team of people because the people on those campaigns were just resourcing. They were they were they were. I was driving the business. They were doing the resourcing. So um, it was great. But COVID put it was stressful. I will add. Um, COVID put an almighty halt to it because, of course. Um, <laughs> The, everyone stopped recruiting. So you had a whole team of five people sat there and none of our clients were recruiting. It stopped dead. So, um, you know, the world post that has been very different for, for us, for our business, how we've reacted and changed and developed. Um, and we, a number of those team members stayed on through furlough, but two of them decided uh, to, to actually go in-house in recruitment. Um, Lee went to actually work for one of our clients at the time, so we got him a job there, which was great. Uh, he's since come back to us, um, which has been brilliant. And, and then after COVID, we really did redesign and redevelop how we wanted to approach volume recruitment. So um, Kelly and Joss historically did more management, but did some client account, which would, which would mean uh, frontline all the way through um, and now we are very much focused towards client delivery so for example Josh and Kelly have have their own clients but as I said they don't just recruit the volume piece they recruit everything for that client um, and then if we have a big campaign we will often put two consultants on that campaign together but I have to say Martin we're now very cautious in in who we work with how we work, what the volumes are. We have to be sure we can deliver. And again, that post-COVID sort of restructure of how we deliver our business has had a big effect on that. Um, and now sort of the challenges are different, um, but they're still there. Well, that, that period of um, where it halted, was that, how long did that last? I mean, I, was it done because companies were like, look, we don't know what's happening. And did they kind of um, communicate that it might be temporary and then it just ca it carried on or how long did it go? Well, it was definitely, uh, these guys might remember as well. So it was definitely, a, I would say, a year. Yeah, um, I, yeah, I would have said about a year. It was, it was like a really tough time for the business, wasn't it? That it, was, it was quite a long time, wasn't it? Can you think mm -hmm. back, guys, when clients of ours, but i tell you the other interesting thing, Martin, it wasn't just about clients not recruiting. It was about an unprecedented period of retention like we've never seen and we'll never see again no. so now we're back to the bad old days of of really struggling to retain people for probably lots of different reasons but i think you know these guys will say that there were clients that no one no one was going to leave the job mid-covid no no i actually did a volume campaign for a client in birmingham and i recruited they wanted 30 they took on 35 and after three months, we still had 34 in their job. And I think that was June 2020. So it was just me and the business. And I was I, I was just doing, I think it was two days a week on the park. Yeah. And it took me about three days to find them. And it was just home working. And it was just so easy. I don't think I would ever work somewhere so easy in my life. Everyone just said yes if they're out of work. They got to sit at home and make money that they couldn't spend. <laughs> yeah so that was sort of in the middle but it was a lovely sort of two days a week for I think a fortnight and I went back on furlough it was just yeah it's just a quick dip in and back out <laughs> yeah. I think you'd say as well Josh as well when we first started four years ago or just over now it was a totally different market to what it is now it's very candidate driven um obviously we didn't even have the flexible working opportunities then for mm -hmm. volume or you know more senior roles it's yeah. um it's very different but josh would have seen a lot more recruitment sort of activity before that i'd come in and that's all i'd ever known so for it to change obviously i do think it's changed for the better because i do think flexible working is a massive thing now and remote working um, especially for volume because fully remote roles that's what agents are sort of looking for now especially the ones that I speak to anyway yeah I was going to ask actually that's is that the sense then that um yeah 
when you get um, a requirement in, you're looking at it going, the, uh, the, more, the higher percentage is going to be people that are going to want to work from home. Mm. It's, it's, I mean, the stat on that, the stats really speak for itself. And, and again, Kelly and Josh will tell you that you um, just talk through guys about putting out an advert for, for, for home working or hybrid versus putting out an advert for um, fully in the office. That's crazy. So we posted an advert for a big campaign that we just started two weeks ago. We had to deliver, I think it was 18 within a week. So myself and I worked on it with Lee um, and it's on the coast. Uh, so it's not great, great place to recruit. I think there's one other contact centre there. It's hybrid and the numbers are insane. So we had 33 interviews, 28 attended and 20 offers in three days. We only wow. did four days work on it. Um, but then I'm recruiting another role, which is Central Manchester, which is four months in the office and then hybrid. I put the advert on Monday. I've had seven people apply. Mm. It's paying up to 28K yeah. for an advisor level role. And that's in really? Manchester. And, so, yeah. that's, and that's just, and that's what great uh, litmus test is there than that? Because you, you're seeing the actual, because there, there is a lot of conversations out there at the moment, isn't there, about where, what is people's preference? Are they missing? the buzz of being back in a contact center or they preferring to uh, the flexibility you get from working from home and you're seeing there's no better measure than what you're seeing there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'd say, I don't know what you guys would agree, but I think there, you know, there's, there's not one size fits all. It is definitely horses for courses. I think um, hybrid model is a, is a really good model but in a hybrid model, as we always say, you still have to find people in that location because it means they still have to go to the office. Mm. Um, a lot of businesses we work with will have 100% remote. Now, to recruit 100% remote is, is relatively easy because you've got a big field to play at. But then you have to weigh up you know, long term and training and development and career and all those other bits. Do you miss out from not being in the office? It's a real, it, it's, a, it's a question that is very difficult to answer because every business, um, dependent on the type of call, dependent on the type of demographic, dependent on so many things, has to find what works best for them. And I think on that, we definitely from us from a recruitment point of view is to offer choice. And that means choice of everything from the hybrid or home working to in the office to shifts to just thinking out the box about what how, how do you attract people that 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 suits but it's it's a very difficult thing to do because a lot of the time as I talk about it it's it's about technology because you have to get the right technology in order to deliver remotely yeah and it's the you made that kind of distinction between pre-covid and post-covid so post-covid for you guys, what's changed? Uh, so now we just say we have to assess whether it's worth actually mm. doing the recruitment. Pre-COVID, if they had staff on site, we we really would take it on because they've got staff yeah. there. So someone's done it before. We would have probably nine times out of ten took that work on, just said that we're not going to overpromise, we'll try our hardest. And nine times out of ten, we delivered as well. But now, if they're central Manchester 100 percent on site. We can place them there, but they're going to get 10 phone calls in the next month or two saying, hi, we've got a hybrid role. Hi, I've got a full remote role. They're just not going to stay. Um, the business will eventually learn and they, they will adapt mm. um, to hybrid or home working. But sometimes it just takes time for them to lose all their staff and realise. It's. I think it's a big frustration. And Josh is right. You know, frustration for us. And we talk to clients. Of course, we, we give what we consider to be really good market leading advice. And as you said, Martin, we do do the litmus test. We are doing it day in, day out, not just in one location, not just for one type of industry. You know, we not just for, for 10, you know, the volumes are all different. Everything's different. But what we can tell you is, as Josh absolutely says, is if you don't listen to us or if you don't take some of our advice on board, it's gonna, you're going to have to learn um, and it's going to be expensive to learn. And I think that's a massive frustration for us. But we also 100% appreciate and understand that a business can't change its model overnight. Well, they're saying that a lot did in COVID. But, mm. you know, yeah. 
for a longer term strategy, you've got to get it right. And that's about people, that's about engagement, that's about technology, that's about process, that's about lots of things. I think what we find frustrating is that clients still can't quite grasp it. And so they're going to have to learn the hard way. And some businesses just can't do it. That They can't do the hybrids because of like sensitive information. Uh, I've spoke to hiring managers. I've literally gone to other sites in the kitchen to try and tempt staff. They're that desperate. Um, it's just been, yeah, it's been quite crazy. There's something you said earlier about um, for you guys, uh, Kelly, you're, if you're, you're working on the management side for a client and also you will do volume mm-hmm. recruitment. Does that really help with understanding the, the culture and that you're you're more aware of what the requirement is because you're you're seeing kind of both of those different sides definitely I yeah I'd completely agree with that because you get to see what the sort of role responsibilities are for the management and agent level as well so it gives you a really good understanding of what the business needs are what the the you know whether it's a a contact center operations manager team manager it could be associate director it could be any of those um but when you're working on your own individual clients it really gives you an outlay of yeah of everything really so it's um what's important to us is that the client we meet what the client's requirements are um and it builds that relationship and trust and you know we're very much a trusted recruitment um agency so and hopefully we're well known within the industry as well <laughs> that's always a good uh, thing do you have um do you have to help i'm not meaning this in a detrimental way but do you have to help educate your clients around how candidates key drivers have changed yeah i think more so now like definitely more so now um just going back to what you were saying about COVID and, you know, everything else that happened there. And um, it's been a massive learning curve for all of us. Uh, and that's why when Francesca and Josh have just spoke about, you have to be very selective with your clients now. Um, I wouldn't say that you have to be harsh or anything like that, but you, you certainly have to outlay, you know, if you, if this isn't going to happen, then, you know, they're not going to achieve what they're looking for. Um, and, you know, because at the moment it's crazy here there's so much business that's come in we're in you know touch with a really good place at the minute with everything um but you know that that's not forever you know think as we know in recruitment it can go in up and down like a yo-yo so <laughs> roller coaster yeah literally so yeah and what are the what are the key drivers then for for candidates and have they significantly changed and I think so, yeah. It used to be a lot about money. Uh, I'd say, oh, I haven't obviously got a stat, but I've been working the last three or four days on that campaign in Manchester, and it's just home working. Mm. So many candidates just don't want to leave their house. Mm. They would rather take an 18 grand job and sit at home than the 20 odd plus five, 10 grand bonus that I've got, um, which two years ago it was all about who's paying the most money. I'm going to jump ship there. And and yeah, so I think, I think that's a big game change. People just want to be at home. They've got used to it. Yeah, I think it's it's the interesting one for us, Martin, is that in the contact centre industry, unlike other industries like finance and banking, um, people are 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 actually much more comfortable with being in their home and learning. And I'm not being detrimental when I say this, but the industry, depending on what type of call you're making, sometimes those calls are, they are, it isn't like you have to do years and years of training. You know, it is something that quite often you can pick up quite quickly. Um, and in, in contact centres, it is tough, not impossible, but it is tough to have a career out of it. There are lots of people that do, of course they do. But fundamentally, you're looking at a pyramid structure where there's a lot of people at the bottom and not so many at the top. And that's that's just the reality of what, 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 what we do. I think different industries require different things. And I think contact centres is one of those industries. And I say this to clients all the time. We are so fortunate that we are an industry that lends itself so well to remote and flexible working. So, And because of that, you should take advantage of it. Um, And, you know, in retail, 
um, in so in hospitality, in so many other sim warehousing, in so many other similar salary businesses to frontline recruitment, frontline um, contact centres cannot do that. They are never going to be able to offer you home working. You have to be there in, in person. Um, so it can be a bit of a frustration for us because as long as you've got the training in uh, and, and, and it works well, I think some of the businesses' frustrations is that they are heavily invested in property. And yeah. you get that. You know, crikey, you, you know, you're you're a business leader, you're a finance director, and you're looking at a huge cost for a building in the center of Manchester, and yet you've got 90% of your staff who want to work from home. I mean, it's it's tough. It's tough to 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 marry all those bits together. But um I think businesses are definitely adapting and learning. And I think that there are lots of models that will come out in the future that will look very different to what was certainly in, con in the contact center, customer service type world, very different and sales as well. Very, very different. And you said at the outset around um, the market's candidate driven now. And does that mean that as well as the kind of, you know, you had two, if you've got two choices, both offering working from home then it then it as well as similar money let's say then does it come up into play things like what's employee engagement what's development look like are those the types of considerations that you would check through when you get a campaign do you think right what how many ticks in this list of things have we got here to be able to attract candidates josh yeah, I, th I think big ones, benefits. A recent campaign I did, the benefits are absolutely amazing. Um, candidates love benefits, especially when it's money off sort of utilities. Um, and it includes things like Bupa, cash plans, decent pensions, like holidays into like the mid 30s. Um, but then again, they've probably been competitive. They've, they've probably been competing with another call centre at a different site and they've had to up that and slowly up it and they've got to a point now I don't think they can go any further it's just so good and as isn't a whole package great, it's great isn't it to hear that because mm. these used to be either things you kind of ignored as, yeah. a, as a potential candidate or now that mid-30s for holiday <laughs> that is brilliant yeah I think they as well going off the benefits that I think one of the most important things to clients now or businesses um, is the attrition, the attrition of staff. And you need to keep those on board, you know. So it, I think with the benefits and that sort of thing, they're more inclined to stay, the more they imply, you know, flexible work and all of those key factors will keep that person engaged and, and with that business, you know, because they're looked after. Yeah, I would agree. I think I think interestingly, Martin, there's lots of research out there, and I read a lot of it all the time. I, I read a brilliant article the other day that basically um, did a, a piece of research around productivity, um, work, home working versus office working, and it was in this particular piece of work, it was you know overriding that productivity is higher at home mm. that the amount of time people who in the office are spent chatting socializing with each other um being on social media far more um just lots of things lots of distractions which i'm not necessarily saying are are unimportant i think sometimes those distractions are really important and they do build a team and having a a, a fully a fully remote working team doesn't always work but again i will caveat that by saying as a team at cactus we are hybrid. We work some of the time in the office, some of the time at home. Every morning we have a Teams meeting where we chat and we laugh and we sometimes do quizzes and, and still maintain, but we still talk business, but we still maintain that interaction and that fun. And often we'll have chats in the day and, and have conversations. But I, it is great also to be in the office and have those things. But going back to that whole productivity piece, historically, those business leaders that felt, and I know lots that do, that feel that, oh, we can't trust our workers to work from home. We can't trust the productivity. It's going to go down. I have to say, I think that is absolutely 100% wrong. Mm -hmm. I think you're employing the wrong people in the wrong jobs if you're not getting that productivity right. Mm -hmm. And I think it, and that sounds very simple, but I really believe in that. Uh, and again, you know, I only have to look at my own team and our own business to see productivity from, from 
from our team is through the roof in comparison to a, a full time in the office working. I mean, I don't know, perhaps Kelly and Josh, <laughs> they might disagree. But I think for certainly for even just looking at our numbers this year, it, they speak for themselves. It's funny, isn't it? Because the, um, there's this phrase that I saw in a BBC um, article that said uh, productivity paranoia. So that there's still a high percentage of people in management positions still have this paranoia that people are not productive, even though the stats are showing them that they are more productive. And you just think you've got to catch up. They, they've got mm -hmm. to progress their mindset because otherwise that will permeate into how they show up as a culture and, and it will make it harder to um, attract talent. I'm really interested in your, you mentioned something when we were talking about this being the topic about the, um, how your methodologies have changed, that it was, and I can't remember the exact terms that you used, but you have to do far more searching and selection now. Mm. It, what what does that actually how has that manifested itself what does that what does that mean for you guys actually doing it i think we did a lot of it anyway um in regards to searching um because you know you could you know, get a load of applications that come through you would spend all of your time going through those applications and there might be only two you know i don't know two or three that are relevant so I mean, I don't know if Josh does the same, but I tend to search first on all of the job boards, LinkedIn, massive tool. I mean, that's my favorite. I, you know, been very successful with finding people and having that network on LinkedIn. I just think it's an amazing tool and, you know, we use it every day. Um, but then obviously you've also got the job boards as well, um, which we've got a selection of those. Um, so you do really have to filter through keywords. So it is very hard. I mean, I can't speak for all recruitment companies. I don't know if they just rely on, you know, applications. But one thing, and obviously Francesca would say, and she always says that about myself and the team, is that we do search, we hunt, you know, for those individuals. And if they're not, you know, if they're not looking at the time, we always say to them, you know, if you've got any recommendations, put us in touch, keep our details, that sort of thing. So I think that's a really important. I'm a heavy searcher. All I do is search. <laughs> and all I've ever done is search. I literally get a job. Gap, I, I always try to hope that I've got four or five people within two hours of getting the job. Mm. Really? Um, yeah, I just smash through all the job boards. Um, I think the best, I think the biggest thing is when you search on the job boards, uh, I don't know if you've been on them, but other agencies and that they may listen to this it the ones that look the candidates that look like oh they're going to be no good click on them there's so many candidates mm. that just don't enter their details right on the job boards or update them yeah yeah i worked um on a sales trainer for a business in london probably about a year ago and they'd used four agencies for a month and i went on read which all the other agencies would probably have and he was the fourth person down and he said night shift worker and i clicked on him and he, he been literally at the same type of business and he placed them three days mm. and they great. must have all just gone past him thinking oh he's a night shift worker i think it's a bnm so it probably looked like a warehouse worker but no he was he was like the, the trainer of the whole site for a contact center in london so yeah it's really just looking at everything yeah and, and on that martin i always say and i don't you know i don't want to sound like a like a big show off but um if I have a client that says to me, like, what's the market? Like, how's it, how, do, how does this compare? You know, what's, how am I going to, am I going to find people? I said, right, I tell you what, we'll go and have a, we'll, we'll put an hour or so into this. And I'll, I'll speak to the team. I'll speak to Kelly and Josh or whoever's got some time. I said, because if one of my team members, and, but you have to remember, I caveat this with, you're only looking at a certain moment in time. So what we're looking at today can look very different tomorrow. Yeah. But I will say to my client, right, I give it to one of my members of the team right now today if they can't find that person that person is probably not there to be found because I know that I have a team of people who of consultants who are they're so they're so talented in recruiting across the board which gives them so many skills and those skills are then used to hunt for frontline level all the way through to director level and and it's heavily invested um you know they 
really understand how to get the most out of it. And we are heavily invested in doing that. I mean, there are lots of recruitment businesses I speak to and, and um, candidates that have come, you know, perhaps come and I interview them to come work for us. And I'll say, so you've all got, you've got a recruiter license each, have you? No, we've only got one recruiter license in the whole business. And you think, oh my life, I mean, how can you do that? How You're just not investing in your people and you're not investing in your business. And I often talk to clients and I say to them, I'll tell you a really good litmus test about the agency you're dealing with. Find out if they've all got recruiter licenses. Find out if they're really invested in those consultants because those recruiter licenses allow them access to candidates and also help them build their network. It's so it's so unique to them, so unique to each person in our business and so important that you give the team the tools to, to go out there and find candidates. And so many times I'll have clients say to me, yes, who have you got on your books? <laughs> <laughs> I think I've said this to you before, Martin. Books, yeah. I mean, <laughs> there are no books anymore. You know, these books are burnt. They're dead. Um, the pages have fallen out. Um, it's not about, it's no longer about books and, and databases. It's about the here and now. Yeah. It's about finding people that are available and ready and up for it and, and engaged right now. And the best way, as Kelly and Josh know only too well, to, to source those is to forget, yes, you've got to put the adverts out there. You want to try and build a brand that you're looking for people all the time. But fundamentally, their, their first port of call is go and hunt people because mm. they're, they're not wasting time by doing that. Yeah, I often, I often think that if I'm looking through um, LinkedIn and thinking about you guys that we're we're bombarded with so much information all the time you can't rely on just uh, an advert to attention grab significantly enough to be able especially when you're talking volume so you have to be able to do the the hunting and the and the searching that you that you do because you as you say you can't be passive can you no no do you when you think about um if you have a campaign that's volume of advisors is there such a what are the things that you look for what is the the holy grail when it comes to an advisor uh demographic or makeup are there things that you can go oh yes good 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 i just think it, it it's based on when you have that initial conversation with your client they really do set expectations but also you get the copy of the job spec you learn about the company values, that sort of thing. But I think really in every sort of advice is there's three, two or three sort of key factors that the client will want. You know, it could be contact centre. It could be that they have to have um, come from a regulated background. It could be that they've got to have live chat experience. So it really is client dependent. Um, yeah, that, that that's what I would say on that. But I think you guys know both of you, because obviously we don't just, we, we have to go hunt, hunting for people on paper, but then we speak to them. And I think that the real, another real skill that the team have, especially Kelly and Josh, is that when they're on the phone, they know what good sounds like. Mm. Yeah. And, and they, you know, they both have a real sense of who is going to, who, who is going to actually come across really well. Um, and also it's not just about that. And again, these guys, I'm probably speaking, talk, you know, speaking from them, but it, it is also about getting a sense of, is that person engaged? Does that person really, do they sound interested in this job, in this client, in this brand, in this product? Mm. Do I think this candidate is going to mess me about? Do I think this candidate could, if they go to the interview, would actually take it? So there's so much more than just matching someone to a set of criteria. It's all mm. the other bits that go with it. And I think what, like, just quickly on that with, you know, you could have a candidate that's got a jumpy CV. Um, that, again, you, you can sort of sense when you're speaking to that candidate if they're telling you the truth or not. <laughs> um yeah it's um yeah definitely agree with that as well i love this whole idea of um when you're conducting those calls um because it does take me back to when i was involved in recruitment from some of our big campaigns when i was at an outsourcer and you would say oh have we have we done like we've spoken to them on the phone right or, or we've done role plays with them and sometimes the answer would be no and you look, but how yeah. how can you tell whether they're going to be any good or not? So when you're 
when you're conducting those calls, are you you're listening with the, with the mindset of a customer, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I always like with, with my clients to fully know what they actually do on the phone. Mm. So I'm working with like a legal sort of contact center business at the moment. And I will literally talk them through me being a customer calling it. Yeah. Then go in and mm. that's where you answer the call and you go through these questions, blah, 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 blah. Do you reckon you could do that? And it is a dialer because a lot of people don't realize that actually mm. it is like the olden days where you're just ringing off a phone and then you can have sure, a break. Yeah. It, it's constant. It just keeps going and going and going until you put yourself to lunch or personal time um, to really see if, if they want the job rather than turn up on the day and sort of not realizing what they've signed up for. Um, I can speak from experience of using the dialers. I did that for yeah. many years. Yeah, same here. Um, yeah. It's, um, you know, you have wrap up times, you know, break times um you know it's it's really hard to get used to that if you if you're not from that environment so it is like just said really important that that candidate knows what they're going into um, I, I think on that Kels and both of you are absolutely right again I you know I'm sort of um <laughs> I'm, I'm promoting these guys but only because I know these skills work and the fact is that it, it is so important. They're investing in this. They're investing in these conversations and asking these questions and ensuring that these candidates really understand what the job is. Mm. Because fundamentally, they don't, none of us want that candidate to drop out. Yeah. Our whole focus is about ensuring that candidate starts, number one, and number two, that they stay. You've got to get them through the door. And yes, yes, there is an element of, you, you know, you, you do all that work to ensure the job is right, so their expectations are right, so they stay within the job. But we're heavily reliant on a good candidate journey, good candidate experience, and then a really good employee engagement, which is critical. And it's out of our hands, frustrating for us at times. Mm. But that is what these guys are talking about, Martin, is, is going such a bigger extra mile talking through these jobs, really understanding these jobs, managing those expectations. We constantly manage expectations, client and candidate, because fundamentally at the end of the day, for all of us, client, candidate, and us, we want that candidate to start and stay. Yeah. And turn up to interview. <laughs> so, well, yeah. But yeah, just taking that extra few minutes really <laughs> does help. And if you really feel like you've got that candidate that isn't going to go, just send them a text saying, can you send me your updated CV? It's not opening because it's PDF. If they send you, send them. Um, so yeah, there's loads of little sort of tips and tricks you can do just to make sure that people turn up and you send I them the right like, as, Sorry, Josh. Like, I think as well, you know, years ago, we, well, not that many years ago, we used to do assessments, assessment centres. That, that was massive, you know, a massive thing went for volume recruitment when I first started. Um, and we used to have to do a lot with that. Um but I think what's good now, that's not as common anymore. You yeah, don't really have that common. trend of assessment centres. And we really do do that ourselves now. And I think in a sense, it's better because you are seeing that process through yourself and hand holding it, whereas you're not relying on other people to do it. And I do quite like that. If I was a client listening to this or a potential client, I would be reassured just how you've talked through that kind of understanding the job that they're going to do, really making sure that the candidates are going into this with their eyes wide open, mm. but also that based on your skills and experience, you're assessing whether someone is answering the right way or sounds committed. This is this is something that I always think it's like innate, isn't it? Your it's your skill set based on your experience that sometimes can't be defined, but it you know when a candidate is going to be good or not yeah. based on how they're interacting with you. And I think that kind of diligence and the, the work that you guys will put into that would massively reassure me. It must be tough. It must be tough, though, if you're talking, you're not talking for like single candidate, you're talking volume. So to have yeah. to do that <laughs> to everyone and know that, you know what, oh, I can't, this person hasn't shown up the way we'd like in how they're interacting with me. So I'm not going to put them through. So I've got to go back and then replace that person. It's, it, it's tough. I think as well is when you think, you know, you've got a candidate that's really bought in um, and this happens a lot, not just volume. It happens with everything you think. And then they just don't turn up. And it's like 
some the clients will be like well that you know just to let you know they haven't why haven't they and it's like you can be uh, you know 99.9 percent sure that they are going to turn up that interview and then you just ghosted it's mm-hmm. like they've disappeared they've blocked you off linkedin telephone numbers and then you know it, it, it's just crazy absolutely crazy yeah I think it, it, you know, the, the whole process, going back to what Kelly was saying, Martin, has been very interesting post-COVID. And we've gone from having, as she says, um, managing very large assessment centres in person, um, which is incredibly stressful, time-consuming and expensive to achieve. And I understand, you know, we all thought, class and us alike, that that was the right way to assess volumes of people. I I think 100% fundamentally, the COVID has allowed us to understand and be far more um, open with what is the right method to assess. And right now, there is no doubt in my mind that face-to-face assessment centres is a thing of the past. People don't want to do it. They're not going to turn up for it. It is too much time invested and you don't need them. You know, this is a transient. It is transient. However much you'd like to say every person you recruit is going to stay with you for four years, that is not going to happen. Mm. So you've got to accept the fact that you're in a very fast-paced market and your your absolute goal is to recruit the best people you can for your business in as short a time possible. And yeah. that means engaging with really good consultants who, as we've talked about, really understand what good looks like, but making sure that you are getting them through, they are engaged, you're assessing them that, that, and that assessment is fit for purpose and you are offering them a job really quickly and starting them really quickly. Mm. I, I, I can see that completely. I imagine being on a call with either you, Kelly or Josh uh, is a far better yardstick of whether someone's got going to be good in their role rather than a group activity at an assessment centre or or what all the other things that those assessment centers entailed talking to you guys and do you ever get do you ever get it that where someone looks good on paper and then just doesn't show up from a communication point of view yeah <laughs> all the time yeah <laughs> uh, you are shocked sometimes so you'll, you'll see six years here four years there massive names and yeah you're just quite shocked that that's their cv um but again, sometimes you just have to put candidates forward because they might just be shy on the day. They could have a personal issue that day. You just don't know. You've got to take everything into consideration. Yeah. Um, and that goes to show for, for those assessment centres as well. If, if you're not an outspoken person and you're quite shy, people just go into their bubbles and they didn't get the job because they didn't speak in a massive group of 10 or 20 people. And now they get that one-to-one with an interviewer or a team leader and that it's a lot easier to open up and potentially get that job where you wouldn't have in the past just because you're not loud. So some of, the, yeah. some of the best people I ever worked with from an outbound. And also, um, Kelly, you mentioned debt collection. I always I always say, if you did well at that, you can do anything in a contact centre. <laughs> yeah, I yeah, I do you know what? That was one of my favorite jobs. Um, I was there six and a half years, and it was really that was my first prior to that I did a little bit of waitress and everything whilst I was at college but then it was my first ever you know concrete job and I lasted there for quite a while and I really really enjoyed it you know a lot of people think it's give me your money and that's it but it's really not it's you know about understanding you know why they are not everyone isn't in a position where they don't want to pay it's just because they can't it's about help supporting them and you know achieving you know not just for the business but for affordability for them as well and their families so and you also have the reverse don't you just going back that Josh where you said that you found you know you can't be fooled by the the CV or what's shown up on a on a job board and I hadn't ever really thought about that where people have just put in the bare minimum of information and it's you guys that have to go in and explore and and look at everyone on it has that has that also changed post covid just the extent to which you have to search far more than you ever used to? Um, I think so. Um, it's really tricky, obviously, your keywords within a, an amount of miles um, of their postcode. 
So you're putting customer and service and advisor within five miles, and those words get picked up out the CV. Uh, so you know all of those words are in all of those CVs, but all you get is a little glimpse, and it just says desired job title, current job title, and then salary. And you just got to go into every single one. But in some areas, there might be 1,800. That's a long week, that is, when you only need to find five people to start on Monday. Um, but yeah, like yesterday, oh, I did one client all day, advisors, I picked up the work. It was sort of the afternoon before. And I think probably made a good 110, 120 phone calls. Probably mm. spoke to 30 people and found eight. Mm. I've got four in today, four in, no, two in tomorrow and two in on Monday. So if you can put the effort in, that's eight potential starters. Do you know so the time? Those eight start up and five get the job. It's a really good day's work. Do you know the times that they're all meant to be going for their interviews and you're kind of like ex- expectant? Yeah, of course. Yeah, no, everything. I'm really bad compared to everything. Everyone, everything's in my head. Um, if anything ever happens to me, no one will know what's going on. I know <laughs> Kelly's really good with her admin, but I, 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 ran, it. I, I ran a HTV logistics team for like two years and I had about 90 drivers. I knew all their shifts. I knew, I knew all their days off. And back then, the people I used to work with say, like, if you ever have a day off, everything was in my head. Josh, if you were a woman and you ever had to have, if you ever had to go through menopause, you'd be absolutely screwed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's yeah. true. Then on the flip side, someone might get a job in the office, and I, I could have spoke to a candidate three years ago, and I remember their name. It, it has the advantages, and it's quite yeah. common. I send that CV. They're like, wow. I and can only, like, I can only dream of that sort of recall. I mean, that's yeah, so I, unfair. That is. I, I will. Yeah. I was just going to say again, and and probably Josh more than anyone else has had experience of this. Martin, the the fact that we're talking a lot about customer service type type volumes, but the world of sales, telephony sales, is another world yet again. Again, I think it was already starting to change pre-COVID, but post-COVID is just a whole different ball game. And Josh yeah, is really probably rough. both Kelly and Josh are good to speak about that. But I mean, what? Just talk through Josh some of your experiences of trying to recruit salespeople now. Well, pre-COVID, it was relatively easy because it was mm. on site and it was all about how big the bonus was, and no one really cared about the basic as long as it was over sort of twenty. It was all about the bonus, but. Now, God, it's really tough. Um, I, I put an advert on for a role that's paying 25 and up to 50 in London on Monday. And I, one person applied and I sent them and they actually got the job today, which was great. And they start Monday, but no one's applied all week. Post-COVID in London, God, that would have probably had hundreds, yeah, hundreds of applications. It's really tough. But then I did another campaign in Manchester in January, probably pay, placed about 25 uh, advisors. Um, and that was hybrid so it's about depends on area going back to our conversation we actually had this yesterday if you remember that obviously we can't mention the client names that sort of thing but um you said that we worked together on those sales roles a few months ago and then we had literally nothing it was so hard to find somebody and then yesterday you found all of those people so it just shows how quickly the times have changed I think every client's different depending on where they are as well. Mm. Uh, we get some really easy areas and we get some difficult ones. So I did nearly 80, 90 positions in Vista pre-COVID. And I'd say 50% of them, I was recruiting in London because they were languages. Mm. And I was, I was setting up virtual interviews. And then I was going on spareroom.com and I was, how, I was trying to help them find a property so they could move <laughs> to and start their new career. Honestly, I, I probably, yeah, I was going on there and I, I was helping them set up like rooms and stuff. Going on Google Maps. Yeah. They wouldn't move now. It's a totally different world. That business mm. I've had to adopt um, home working. Some of their advisors live in Cornwall. They're, they're up in Edinburgh. But yeah, no one would what move. What this does though, it, it, it talks to what you said, Fran, was that you guys go the extra mile um, for your for your clients and your and your candidates because that is going over and above, isn't it? Mm. Of, yeah, uh, I used to send them an email with like the local shopping centre, Bista Village, everything you can do in the local area, how nice it was compared to London because the countryside. Um, <laughs> and literally, so many people did move. It we was used a really to call good him, job. Um, it was recruit- a good job. We used to call him like the letting agent as well as recruitment. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
think what it, what, it, what it does say, though, is just going back to that whole piece about sales is it has changed and the perception of selling has changed so much over time. And it is a tough job. I think it makes people realize, you know, in a similar vein, recruitment is a very tough job and you've got to be incredibly resilient. And I think only now our industry is understanding the reward is really important because you don't do it for any other reason. Mm. You know, it, it, you know, you can enjoy the customer service, you can get it, you can get a good feeling about it. You like, you know, it's, you can be slightly, it's a little bit more around the, the feeling that you get about doing that job, the good feeling in sales, you, to be really good at it, you do it because of the reward. Yeah. And I think that we're now at a point where businesses are finally understanding that it is, it is the engine room of your business and it deserves it, it deserves to be put up there in terms of what that reward looks like. And those companies that don't get it and those companies that don't offer the reward, they're, they're not going to get the results. No. And it's that simple. Do you, um, it's, it's always come across every time we've done a podcast, um, just how much you work for your, your clients and um, how committed you are. From your point of view, and it, that sense of partnership with your clients is really important. When you have um, a new client come on, is are there, are there things that you hope for, that you hope that you're going to get from them um, from, the, from the straight off the bat? Well, I'm just going to say one thing on that, and then I'm going to leave Kelly and Josh to say what they would say. The biggest hope I have is you have a client that is really listening to you and is engaged with you and is taking on board what you're saying. And that, it, and it's just, often we come off the phone, we've had, a, we've had a, uh, an initial meeting with a client and you'll, you'll get a real sense of, and the best thing ever is when you come off and you think, they really get it. They understand it. They've done it. They really, you know, they really, they, 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 you're in the same corner. You're fighting the same battle. They, it, you're going towards the same goal. The business might, might not be able to provide all the things that you'd like it to, but just to have that empathy for me is one of the best bits. And I'm, I'll leave Kelly and Josh to say what, what yeah. for them. Pace. Pace. <laughs> I yeah. can't reiterate pace enough. Like, how fast clients are going to move for one. Um, sometimes it is out of their control, but I just think these days you need to, and going back to what we said about being a candidate market, not a, the candidates won't hang about. So the clients need to be on it. They need to. So for me, that that is a massive thing, you know, with yeah. checks, background checks, um, getting the interview stages if there's one two three stages getting them within a week or two you know it I just think it's so so important um and clients you know I work with a couple of clients and you know uh, there's a couple of candidates that I've been working with that they've been in the process a month you know that not all candidates would hang about um you know because the market is so competitive um with certain roles industries you know, it might not be the same as today as it is tomorrow. You know, it, it changes all of the time, as we know. But yeah, I just think time is just so important. That's a great consideration. It's what is one that I hadn't even really um, considered. But you, so you need you need to help the client have that urgency to go. Look, yeah. you're going to lose these good candidates if you're not on it. Yeah, and Kelly's very good at that because we do joint stuff <laughs> together and she usually takes the lead. Um, she's really good at that. Um, Lee, look, that. That's why I come from debt collection. You have to trade. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You have to trade. The thing is, you know, that client could be doing 101 other things. You know, they, they have, you know, busy lives as, and we appreciate that. But if they're not on the ball and they're not moving as fast as the candidate wants that we would like, that can, and it's happened before, you know, some of my clients and some of the guys' clients that I work with that, you know, they're like, oh, we really liked her and oh, it's because of annual leave or it's, oh, we just need to double check something or the roles got put on hold and you've done all of that work. And it's just like, 
if you would have done that within a week or so, you would have had them, they would have been onboarded, you would have had the checks, the HR. So yeah, process and time is just, yeah. you need to be on it. I think we've learned a lot of that from you as well, Francesca, to be fair. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm glad no, you've learned something, Josh. No, I was always, <laughs> yeah. So obviously before I joined here, I was always in temp recruitment and you just literally took on whatever come. No matter what it was, you were like, yeah, yeah, I'll get it done. And you tried your hardest to fill it. And then I started doing some sort of calls with clients and that with you. And you're just not afraid. So you were literally just go, I don't think we can do that. It's going to have to be this. or It's just not going to work. Yeah. And you're not afraid to turn down work if you don't think it is going to work. Um, well, no, kind of, yeah. no, and you're right. And I'm, I'm not afraid to do it because I just feel, A, it's not fair on on it's not fair on anyone. It's not fair on the client. It's not fair on you. It's not fair. It, and it won't work. So I, I would much rather just be really honest and say, I mean, there are so many agencies out there that will just say, oh, you know, yeah, of course we can do it. Cause you just want to take the business on whatever, but you just stand to, to disappoint. Yeah. I think it took me about a year of listening to you do it before I sort of adapted myself. <laughs> um, but also it's good in the long run. Because when you're three weeks later and you're halfway through the campaign, Francesca's already told them it's got to be quick. It's got to be this. And we can say, look, yeah. we can say at the start, it's yeah. got to be like this. I said, not going to work. So it yeah. is good. To, it, I think we've both learned up and we can to get everything in that first initial call. Yeah. To tell them how we work and how best we think it should work. And then we haven't got to sort of keep pushing back and feeling like we're overstepping by saying this has got to happen by tomorrow. And because we, we did it weeks ago, we've already told them. Um, I, but I think that. that I think Josh that also comes from me learning um you know when we first took on volume resourcing and just learning that I the team and I could not mentally take on the constant rejection and the feeling that it was our fault yeah so I think you I had to find another way to be resilient and be able to turn around and say hang on a minute I'm going to tell you from the start this is how it's going to be and I cannot afford for you, Mr. Client, to blame me and my consultants for candidates not turning up, for, for numbers not being, because I'm going to give you everything I've got, but I, I can only lead the horse to water. I cannot make it drink. So I think for a, a long time of, you know, being, it's, it's very, very difficult to manage, very stressful to manage, constant feeling that you're the person that's being, um, you know, it, the blame is on you, that I, I had to manage the expectation better. Yeah. And I think as well, on, on um, it, that's why it's so important for the client to be brought into us on that first initial stage and to get everything out, because more often than not, that, you know, clients will use various recruitment agencies at the same time. So it's important that we build that trust and that relationship with that client to get the exclusivity on it as well just to yeah. speed the process up and you know touching on the points that Francesca just mentioned as well or just yeah again I, I think that's a really key factor within that yeah well it's, 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 you're having a relationship aren't you and the a good healthy relationship is around expectations and if you're setting those expectations mm. you know what the client can expect from you and how you show up and what you expect from them and how they show up to your point then it makes it it's a healthier relationship mm -hmm. for the rest of time isn't it yeah absolutely well look, this has been illuminating and again i'm i'm not surprised <laughs> but i've learned loads and probably other people listening maybe in your industry that have also have also picked yeah. up tips. but i think that's testament to uh the the people you are and the kind of your your confidence comes from from experience and doing it and also the riding through the ups and downs of, a, of an industry that's tough isn't it yeah yeah it, it is tough martin but i've got to say that we 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 enjoy the fact that it does have a challenge attached to it and we enjoy the fact that we get to speak to loads of different people from all sorts of different walks of life from every type of background uh, you know it doesn't matter age where you're from you know it and we we get to speak to clients across all industries um, and all types of jobs, sales, customer service, you know, tech. And we're very lucky in that respect that we, we get that breadth 
and uh, I think that's what keeps us probably all engaged in it it's not just mm-hmm. the same every day is different every client's different every candidate's different um every yeah. need's different yeah mm. yeah we just, Personally, we just I just yeah I just get a bus uh there's so many buses in the in the um recruitment so you obviously start you find your candidate it's great you get it over then they've got to interview they've got to show up to that and they've got to start and it's all just a big buzz and it just gets to that end point when you've done your job like um it's like a horse race yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, just hope, you just hope you just hope your horse comes in cows over the line yeah <laughs> first every time <laughs> well look we, we as an industry are very lucky to to have you guys your passion is is evident and um you know, we we wouldn't be the industry we are without you. So um, thanks very much. And I, I've really enjoyed this. Yeah, no, me too. Thank you so much. Thanks it wasn't to as you, bad Martin. as you thought, Kelly. Pardon? It wasn't as bad as you thought. No, no, <laughs> I can um, I can stop awkward smiling now. <laughs> <laughs> I just like to talk. <laughs> yeah, well, Josh, Kelly, Fran, thank you so much. Thank Pleasure. you. Thanks, Martin. Bye. 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 Bye.